Good day, everybody. I'm Stacy Beasley, and today I'm going to give a lecture about alcohol and drug use. Let me share my screen. There we go. Okay, so alcohol and other drugs. Here's some images to get us in the mood for what we're about to talk about. Um, alcohol and drugs as a social problem. So drug use. Um, drug use is any substance other than food or water that when taken into the body alters its function in some way. However, drug abuse, and there's a big difference between use and abuse, which is drug abuse is the excessive or inappropriate use of a drug that results in some form of physical, mental, or social impairment. Drug addiction, however, is a psychological or physiological need for a drug to maintain a sense of well-being and avoid withdrawal symptoms. So um, it's important to know that any drug use can cause physical harm. And um, however, when, when we're looking at this from a social problems perspective, it's important to remember that it's the drug abuse that becomes the problem that we're mostly um, looking at in terms of combating drug abuse. So the objective component is it's the physical, psychological, or social evidence of harm, we're like important, and then subjective, right? Um, so the component that is about the people's perception about the consequences of drug use and drug abuse. So here's some um, major patterns of drinking. Um, so oftentimes it can be a social thing. Drinking um, alcohol can vary. You know, some people just get together with others and have a drink on occasion. Um, and so it might be because they're celebrating something. It might be just because, you know, they regularly have a, a glass of wine. And so it can be anywhere from occasional use to frequently used. Um, and so the definition of heavy drinkers is those that consume a greater quantity of alcohol and are more likely to become intoxicated. So, you know, having one drink most likely will not you know, will not result in somebody being intoxicated depending on body weight. Um, however, if when you consume and you can't stop it, you know, it might be a problem. So acute alcoholics have a trouble controlling the use of alcohol and they don't have the ability to, you know, schedule around drinking or the ability to say, you know, two drinks is enough. I need to drive and um, to plan for it. So chronic alcoholics have a loss of control over drinking and sometimes may hide or sneak drinks from their families because the, over time, um, the problem drinking um, or acute drinking or heavy drinking um, creates issues within the family between family members or um, friendships or with relationships with um, significant others. And so in order to avoid those circumstances where they're getting in trouble because they said they wouldn't do it and they're doing it again, um, that's where the hiding and sneaking come into play. So this is a checklist for symptoms um, about alcoholism. So if you can say yes to these, you know, pay attention. So does the person, yes or no, need to drink to get over a hangover? Um, number two, like to drink alone. Number three, lose time from work due to drinking. Number four, need a drink at a, a definite time of day. Number five, lie about or cover up or make excuses about drinking. Number six, suffer loss or memory while, while or after drinking. Number seven, find efficiency or, or drive decreasing. Um, Number eight, drink to relieve stress, fear, shyness, or insecurity. Um, number nine, find that drinking is harming or worrying the whole family. Number 10, become more moody, jealous, or irritable after drinking. Number 11, have a DUI 
um, driving under the influence um, or DWI or which is driving while intoxicated. Um, number 12, rationalize your loss of control over alcohol. So as I read those things, if, if you said yes to any of those um, about a person, maybe you're not thinking about yourself or somebody else, um, that person may be on the road to alcoholism. Um, so, you know, it's important to remember that, you know, to talk about these issues and to, to have conversations with those that you care about and, um, to know that there are resources out, out there in terms of healthcare. Um, if you find that, that there may be a problem. Okay. So alcohol consumption and class, gender, age, and race. So there's some differences here. So, um, yeah, I use Betty Ford, um, the symbol for her, um, in, in the hospital, um, alcohol and drug residency program, um, because Betty Ford, you know, was married, was the first lady married to Gerald Ford in the 1970s. And, um, she was a, a famous, you know, alcoholic. And so as a result of her, um, getting, sober and trying to live better and live without drink. Um, she was able to create the Betty Ford Center and a lot of people that have a lot of money in or you have to have a lot of money in order to be seen there as a patient. And so it used to be the place that um, people would go to, like if you're a star or you had a lot of money. Um, so those with a lot of resources. So the wealthy have greater resources and privacy than lower income individuals and avoid and tend to avoid um, being labeled drunk or alcoholic. Um, so according to the U.S. Census in 2004, 43.4% of people between the ages 12 to 18 report using alcohol at least once, um, So which is you know pretty high. So 17.6% um, reported being current users. And, you know, it's important to know that the vast majority of persons between the ages 18 and 25 have tried alcohol at least once. And, you know, over 60% are current users. And so before the age of 30, white folks consume more alcohol than black folks. And after the age of 30, we see that black folks have more, have higher rates of heavy drinking than do white folks. So let's talk about blood alcohol levels. So from 0.05%, an individual is, feels the sense of release from tension and inhibitions. Um, at 0.10%, an individual's motor control is affected at 0.20%, both the motor and the emotional functions of an individual's brain are impaired. <clears throat> at 0.3%, an individual is incapable of adequately perceiving and responding to the environment and may go into a stupor. And at 0.4% or higher, an individual lapses into a coma and may die. Um... So let's see. So also a part of our culture, there are many unconventional means of getting high and um, our culture, especially our media seems to promote um, the use of alcohol and drugs and, you know, other type of getting high, like sniffing, uh, sniffing petrol, you know, gasoline or sniffing paint thinner and computer cleaner which was called nitro and you know, kids in the nineties were doing this a lot. Um, and so toad licking was a thing that was um, pretty popular in culture. And there's reference to, um, you know, toad licking in a couple of different um, episodes here that are labeled. Um, and so smoking banana peels was a hoax that was to raise awareness of the ethics of taking psychoactive drugs in the 1967, um, you know, in the 1960s, late 60s, especially um, drugs and psychoactive drugs were were um, used more heavily than than they are even today. So let's see patterns of use. 
Um, the majority of adult Americans are drinkers. Um, however, American Indians have the highest rates, Indians, um, meaning like Native Americans, not Asian um, Americans, um, have the highest rates of use and abuse of alcohol. And that that is because genetically they were not exposed over long periods of time that, you know, alcohol has, they've only been exposed to alcohol since European um, the Europeans came here with the settlers and changed their culture dramatically. So through gender, their differences are decreasing and alcohol abuse and alcoholism are primarily male problems. Although of course, you know, women do engage in this behavior and it can definitely be a problem for women as well. However, we see that more men um, than women are affected by this. So alcohol abuse is more common among the young and a substan substantial portion of children and young adolescents also drink. So there are contributing factors to alcohol abuse. There's social structure factors, like um, problems with like role problems that generate emotional distress um, can lead to alcohol abuse, family experiences. So meaning like if you have an alcoholic in your family and you have seen how their alcoholism is, affects them, um, so there, there might be a chance that, you know, a person is turned off at all, you know, totally to drinking alcohol and will not engage. Um, however, having seen some behaviors and also seeing how, um, parents, especially, um, if they use alcohol or other drugs as a form of escapism, and that is the, the method in which, um, a child, um, views how to deal with one's problem, you know, they can also repeat some of those behaviors. So alcohol abu abusers are more likely to come from homes where other family members are abusers. And um, so there's like a genetic component when it comes to this. Um, and so, you know, if you are in a family, if you have family members in your, in, and it could be just, it could be your own like mother, father, your, your um, primary family group. It could be a secondary family group, like grandparents and aunties and uncles. And so if you have alcoholism um, in your family, um, the likelihood of someone else having the a problem with alcohol or drugs is, is greater. So um, alcohol abusers are more likely to come from broken homes and alcohol abuse is associated with various problematic relationships within the family. Um, in mass media also um, plays a part in you know, you know the role modeling and what we see in our popular culture. Um, so research suggests that exposure to movies um, where alcohol use you know can be a risk. So you know we have films I mean that are some of them are very fun and entertaining films however um I mean you can look across for decades to see you know the the, the films that are about alcohol and drug use and some of them have won, won awards I can't remember the name with Nicolas Cage but there was a film with Nicolas Cage won um an award and it was highly praised and it was a hor horrible hard 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 film to watch um, seeing Nicolas Cage's character um, essentially like drink himself to death. Um, there are other films like, um, I don't know, Johnny Depp happens to be one of my favorite actors. And so, you know, there was a film where called Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas and, you know, watching all that drug use, um, you know, Natural Born Killers is another one. The Hangover, I think, is more recent film that you might be familiar with. Um, and so all of these show, you know, methods in which people are using and abusing drugs and alcohol. And um, in a sense, we're, it's being celebrated. Um, so, yeah. All right. So other factors. So factors that increase stress levels are likely to increase the prevalence of alcohol abuse. Um, there are social psychological factors, meaning like attitudes towards drinking and drunkenness that tend to be different from, from attitudes towards use and abuse of other drugs. 
Um, so the ideologies that transform it into a personal rather than a social problem. Um, and therefore there's heavy drinking at parties um, is both acceptable and the way to maximize one's fun. Um, you know, there are some, you know, especially with um, in male culture, um, young men tend to have a culture that glorifies um, this form of toxic masculinity in that they push each other to do things that are very daring and courageous, including, um, you know, drinking games that inebriate some of these young men. And so, yeah, it's a part of our culture and, um, and it's, it's important to be aware of it and be aware of one's place in it. And in terms of, you know, witnessing or taking part or understanding what our friends might be going through. So when it comes to public policy and private action, alcoholics are likely to need individual therapy, drug therapy, behavior therapy, and or group therapy. And, and that is just in, in realize how do you replace those behaviors when you're trying to get well? Um, and so oftentimes alcoholics, when they start getting into their disease, so to speak, um, let's say they're at age 19 um, and they have a problem for a, a drinking problem for the next 15 years. Those, when they started their heavy drinking problem, their maturity level and um, mature, well, maturity level stays the same. It stays, even though you're, let's say 30 ish in the 30 or 30 somewhere, you still, um, actively a 19 year old or have a 19 year old's brain because you didn't, because the development stays stunted. Um, so, so therapy, you know, and trying to like grow up fast and, um, do things that other people, you know, take, you know, advantage of because they do it on a daily basis, adulting, some people would say. <laughs> um, so learning how to, instead of like, do avoidant behavior or have escapism as a behavior escapism in terms of like, I drink my problems away. Um, so they're having to learn how to replace those negative behaviors or risk-taking behaviors with, um, healthy behaviors. And so that that's not as easy as it sounds. So oftentimes therapy is a big part of that. Um, so the social basis of alcoholism must be attacked through public policy to resolve the problem of alcoholism. So therefore, enforcement, prevention, and education programs are definitely needed. Um, and the informal and formal measures can be taken to, to help. And so, I mean, yes, law enforcement can be part of it. And, you know, when a person hits rock bottom, especially if they're deviating, they're being very deviant and breaking laws or whatnot. And so, you know, law enforcement can be a part of that. But then, you know, once once in trying to get a person well, we have come from a very um, um, punish, punishing, we've had a very punishing attitude towards um, towards drug hall, drug drug use and alcohol abuse. And so a lot of what we do has been to punish, punish those behaviors. Um, I think in the early 2000s, we started seeing that our, our public officials and politicians um, realized that our policies are not working and seeing like who's filling the j jails and, you know, see that like marijuana use and, you know, other types of drug use, which is, you know, only for affecting really them personally, um, you know, and they're filling the jails, they're filling the prisons. And so um, is there a better way? And so looking around the world to see where are, where are the places in the world that have better policies in order to get their people healthy. And so we see a big shift in the 2000s um, in public policy to try to get people well and put, you know, getting them into drug treatment facilities. And, um, and that's a wonderful thing. So, all right. So psychotherapeutic drugs have become an important source of abuse. Um, so we're talking prescription, pres prescription drugs 
And um, I mean, we could also talk about things like Adderall, which students are very, um, have been, have, have been, the, the use and abuse of Adderall has been associated with students. And that is because you know, people feel like it helps them to think and helps them to focus. Um, and so there are other, you know, prescription drugs that are pain reliever levers um, and tranquilizers and stimulants and sedatives that are all pharmaceuticals. However, the way that you use them, if you're not using them the way that the, a doctor prescribed them for you, then that's considered abuse. Um, and then they're used for, you know, intoxicating offense, uh, effects. And so you can think about, you know, our loss of um, famous people like Michael Jackson or Tom Petty or Prince that um, all may have um, overdosed as a result of taking fentanyl. fentanyl. Yeah, I'm showing my age with with naming these these three um, artists that I all, of course, enjoyed their their artistry. Okay, so using for intoxicating events. So um, I think this is kind of a little bit repetitive here. Highest rates of drug use of alcohol occur with young um, who are male, young, and poor. And in moving past that. I want to talk about for a moment animism. And so animism is a religious belief that spirits exist in animals, plants, and other entities um, in addition to humans. So animism may also attribute to the souls, to natural phenomenon, geographic figures, and even manufactured objects. So religions would, which emphasize emphasize animism in this sense includes some Native American groups. Um, so just remember that Native Americans um, are not a, a monolithic group. They um, vary from region to region and place to place and not all of them are alike and some have you know have used peyote in their spiritual practices. Um, and so I'm, I would just want you to make sure you know that not all Native Americans um, use peyote or um, tobacco in their spiritual practices. And so others include Shinto, Hinduism, and other pagan faiths. And so, um, so commonly abused drugs can be cabin cannabinoids, depressants, hallucinogens, opiates like opium, which include heroin, morphine, fentanyl, oxycodone, oxycodone, and stimulants like cocaine, steroids, inhalants, like, you know, sniffing, huffing, um, and marijuana. Um, and by the way, marijuana has um, more than one category in which it belongs to. So marijuana is also considered depressant and a hallucinogen. Excuse me. So when it comes to our culture and drug use, um, shamans used to use, um, dr you know, drugs or if you elicit substance. Um, and so some healers or diviners and or witches, um, some in, in terms of like culture have used, um, used, not abused, used um, as a rite of passage. Um, and so I can point to in the, in the United States, the use of peyote, which is permissible um, by law for um, Native Americans that do use it. Um, and so at puberty, there's all, there's, you know, rite of passage. And so there's also vision quests to find oneself and is intended as a spiritual, a part of their spiritual life, um, to help them find direction. So, you know, this is an image here of a shaman, although, you know, this is from, this person is from South America. However, shamans are also found in Europe and Asia. Um, Siberia, Korea, Tibetan Buddhists, um, Hindu and Shinto. In the Americas, we found Native Americans that are considered shamans. Um, so Eskimos and Inuits um, in Mesoamerica, the Mayan and Amazonian. And so in African traditional religions, we've seen witch doctors um, and neo-paganism um, as well. So which is new paganism or the revival of paganism, the old ways, pre-Christian dating um, Christian beliefs. So um, this is an uh, images that, that are 
images that like in the middle here at the bottom is um, Shiva and Shiva is, um, could be, depends on your take on this, um, could be doing divining or, um, and, or could be using illicit drugs to um, have a, a spiritual experience. And so while Hindus will tell you that overall that, that, um, you know, marijuana use is, is strictly forbidden. There are sects, S-E-C-T-S, -E sects of um, Hindus, like this gentleman at the top here that um, worship Shiva and um, as one of their many gods and also um, partake in, in, in smoking um, marijuana. Um, so other shamans of the Amazon and Lake Titicaca um, are, are these images here of these shamans. And so, um, one of the things like, you know, I want to, to share with the class is that drug use in the, in the 1960s, um, started because of the, you know, um, let's say famous, some famous people that, that traveled, to far off places like those that I mentioned, the Amazon, and learned about um, drug use and like ethnographic ways of using drugs. And so Alan Watts in 1962 wrote The Joyous Cosmology and he writes, let me read this to you. There is no difference in principle between sharpening perception with an external instrument such as a microscope and sharpening it with an internal instrument such as one of these drugs. If they are an, are an affront to the dignity of the mind, the microscope is an affront to the dignity of the eye and the telephone to the dignity of the ear. Strictly speaking, these drugs do not impart wisdom at all and more than the microscope alone gives knowledge. They provide the raw materials of wisdom and are useful to the extent that the individual can integrate what they reveal into the whole pattern of of his behavior and the whole system of his knowledge. And so, you know, from this perspective, Alan Watts is saying that drug use um, can be used in order to um, go beyond the self and um, learn how and have a, a, and learn about yourself in order to progress. So um, in the sixties, we saw that there was experimentation with psychedelics um, and so it's another quote from same person. It's like loading the universe into a gun and firing it into your brain. Watts book of the sixties revealed that the influence of these chemical adventures in, on his outlook, he would later comment about psychedelic drug use. When you get the message, hang up the phone. So he wasn't trying to en encourage people to abuse the drugs, but he was saying, if you use it, you get your message and then you stop, um, which maybe not everybody got that message. Okay. So Maria Sabina, um, who is a Mazatec healer and curandera um, and shaman of Oaxaca, Mexico, um, introduced the sacred mushroom ceremony Velada to the world. She allowed Westerners to participate in the healing vigil known as Velada, where participants partic partake in um, psilocybe mushroom as a sacrament to open the gates of the mind. The Velada is seen as a purification and a communion with the sacred. So in 1955, the American banker and ethnomycologist R. Gordon Wasson experienced a Velada with her. And um, he also brought back spores of the fungus, you know, so that he could grow them here. And he identified um, psilocybe mexicana to Paris. Um, and the fungus was cultivated in Europe and is its active ingredient was um, duplicated as the chemical psilocybin in the laboratory by Swiss chemist, Albert Hoffman in 1958. So um, some of you might have, may have seen this image, but not known what you're looking at. So this is Maria Sabina. Um, and so she later became um, um, kind of like a symbol 
of like hippie culture and that um, some hippies were hoping to trip and they called it trip. You know, so just remember that her as a curandera, she was doing a sacred ritual. And so it got changed her, what she was doing, um, Maria Sabina. And so people like John Lennon of the Beatles, Peter Townsend, Townshend, sorry, um, Mick Jagger, Bob Dylan, um, were some of the celebrities who traveled to go seek the spiritual guidance of Maria Sabina. Um, and although uh, the Life article made so Maria Sabina famous, it also brought her great suffering because the use and abuse of what she was sharing with them was not supposed to be abuse. It was not supposed to be the way, you know, the way that it was extracted from her. It wasn't supposed to be harmful. But, you know, that's not, you know, she obviously can't control it once she shared it with others. And so this is the life article that I'm referring to. And so, you know, drug use. Um, and so these are some some pretty famous folks here that are are pop culture figures that have been have public problems with um, illicit drug use. And so um let's see so yeah i mean a lot of folks have had very very um pro public problems and you know we do have somewhat toxic culture in the t in terms of like how um people have are encouraged yeah, especially young people encourage others to use and abuse drugs and alcohol we even have let's say you know you can go to one of the places um in the united states that sell um, medical, not just medical, sell marijuana and you can get them as edibles. And, um, it has definitely taken on a different face since then. Um, and it can, it, we ha have yet to figure out how extensive it might be as a social problem in those places like, you know, California, Colorado, and others where, where, um, use of marijuana in the public's sphere um has have have transformed um those states and so we still are studying that okay so some more images on pop pop culture and drug use um so we see that so fatal car crashes with blood alcohol levels of 0 0.08 or higher um by age category and we see the most the the age range that happens most frequently is the age category 21 to 24. So um, we know who's who's having problematic behavior and overusing here. Um, so it's important to know that alcohol related social problems um, are, you know, can cause health problems because, you know, when you're, when you're constantly ingesting alcohol into your system, you wipe out you know, your, your gut health. And so, and, you know, wipes out your B12 and you need B12. Um, so in order and for neuro neurological reasons. And so there are nutritional deficiencies associated with um, adult onset diabetes, al alcoholic dementia, cardiovascular problems, um, cirrhosis of the liver, um, so right here, it's called alcoholic cirrhosis, but most people notice cirrhosis of the liver, which is scarring of, of the liver. And so fetal alcohol syndrome can result a, a, if the, a mother, a pregnant mother is constantly um, abusing alcohol while pregnant. So alcohol in the workplace can cause lost productivity and costs a lot for treatment. And there may be workplace inju injuries as a result. Um, other things like drinking and driving. So 19% of fatal motor vehicle accidents in which the driver was between the ages of 16 and 20, the driver had a blood alcohol level of 0 0.08. So we know it's happening. The people are drinking and driving, um, and they should not, that's not permissible to drive. You have to be, you, I mean, not to drive, to drink. You shouldn't, you should be 21 years old in, in most States to, to do this. So it also can create family problems in terms of domestic abuse and violence. And there may be patterns of codependency. 
Um, so, I mean, maybe, maybe some of you have heard of um, AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, where alcoholics can go there to get help and support um, to, to get healthy, to get sober. Um, likewise, there are also um, social supports um, for people of that love or have family members or loved ones that um, that are are drug users or alcoholics, and so you know you can develop patterns of codependency, like um, when you're the person that you care for, or love is doing something, you make justifications, you pay for them or give them money for things that they should be able to do um, by themselves or not holding up their responsibilities. You, you, you take their place. Um, you're the responsible party when they should be responsible for themselves and their own behavior. And so you develop um, or a person can develop codependency patterns. And so there are social groups like Al-Anon that help you or help the, the codependent person to learn healthier behaviors and to hold help learn how to hold a person accountable for their own behaviors instead of, um, you know, developing behaviors where you're allowing or in, in, in a certain way, like supporting that person to continue on with, um, with the negative behaviors. So family members unwittingly aid the alcoholic's excessive drinking and resulting behaviors by find figuring out a way how to make things work when the alcoholic is absent or irresponsible or does something that affects the family. Okay. Um, I am going to skip this. Okay. So major hazards with associated with tobacco use. Um, so cancer of the lung, larynx and mouth, esophagus. So you can also develop bronchitis, emphysema, ulcers, and cardiovascular disorders. You also have a shortened life, life expectancy. Um, you know, <laughs> doctors used to encourage women to smoke in like the 60s and 70s because they would tell them your baby, which, you, you know, you could have a lower birth weight was seen as a good thing. Um, and so there's advertisements for smoking in magazines in the 60s and 70s because, you know, it's just the camels, just what the doctor ordered. Like, we know differently now. We know a lot better. And that those low birth weights are associated with negative outcomes late, you know, long later in life for those those children um, where mothers smoked while they're pregnant. So environmental tobacco smoke is highly dangerous. And um, however, I would say that, you know, we still have a lot of people that smoke and now vape is the new thing. Um, but I would say that smoking and vaping is probably um, not nearly as popular or smoking at least is not nearly as popper, popular as it used to be when I grew up. And um, so especially once the tobacco industry had to admit that it was, it had negative health impacts on, on people's health, which they've been, you know, Philip Morris had been denying for decades. Um, so nicotine is highly addictive, um, but they have great marketing. And so they spend more than a $4 billion is spent annually by companies in order to market to, especially young people, um, uh, making, you know, making, you know, smoking look cool or desirable and not just here, but, you know, spend money overseas. So you see that the marble man is like this rugged, you know, individual, very indiv you know, individualistic sort of thing. And the marketing for the marble man is the same thing in China, but except for you see a Chinese face, but it still looks like a cowboy, which is really interesting. Okay. So problems from prescription and over-the-counter drugs. Um, so other types of addiction. Um, and so, you know, Ritalin, Prozac um, have been over-prescribed. There are long-term effects for adolescents. We still don't know totally uh, what those will be. Um, and prescription drugs are being used illegally by teenagers. 2.3 million youths between the ages of 12 and 17 take illegal drugs um, each year. Caffeine is also an active substance and is a dependency producing psychoactive stimulant. 
yes, I'm talking about coffee or the stuff they put in your Coke. <laughs> so caffeine can um, increase the risk of a heart attack and osteoporosis. Um, and so let's see for marijuana use and abuse. Um, most, most users in the United States are between the age of 18 and 25. Um, however, we also see that use the teens, adolescents are also use users, but that's doubled in the past decades. Um, and so heavy use can impair concentration and motivation and high doses during pregnancy can disrupt fetal development and inhalation has been linked to lung problems. While stimulants, um, so cocaine and amphetamine are among the major stimulants used in the United States. Um, cocaine comes from two forms, um, powder, not power, powder and crack cocaine. And so the increase of use of crack cocaine led the Reagan administration in the 1980s to implement the war on drugs. And research shows that crack use is higher among inner city African-Americans and Latino users. Um, however, law enforcement policies and practices may be prejudiced towards minorities. And um, uh, you're going to get a harsher, there's usually in most states, harsher punishments come from use of crack cocaine than there is powdered cocaine. Um, so children born to crack addicted mothers usually suffer painful withdrawals at birth and later show deficits in cognitive, cognitive skills, thinking. Okay, so chronic um, amphetamine abuse can result in an amphetamine psychosis, which looks like sometimes paranoia, hallucinations, and violent tendencies. While depressants, um, most common include barbiturates um, and anti-anxiety drugs like tranquilizers, Valium, Milton. Um, and so users may develop both physical addiction and psychological dependency. Um, so if you mix the drugs, it can be, have an even greater effect. And so, um, because, you know, alcohol is a depressant and then taking drugs on top of, especially, especially if they're depressants on top of that can really give you, um, I guess, get people high. So it's something you want to be very careful with. Um, so when it comes to biological and psychological factors, um, genetic factors through impaired enzyme production and brain function and their in the physiological response, um, drugs such as alcohol, air, heroin, cocaine act directly on the brain mechanisms and are responsible for reward and punishment. Um, when it comes to psychological, social learning and reinforcement on drug taking, there's social learning and reinforcement on drug taking behavior. Um, there may also be personality disorders like um, having a tendency to be in, impulsive and or um, having anxiety. And I'm not just talking like in situational anxiety, like you're moving and moving is one of the most difficult things. Um, so is getting married. Um, so is having a death in the, in your family. So well, those are situational. So personality disorders, like generalized anxiety, where they constantly feel anxiety day in and day out and it's chronic. Okay. So this is social theory here. And so we're using social theory to help understand drug use and alcohol addiction. So symbolic interactionists would say that drug behavior is learned and influenced by families, peers, and others. Um, if you all remember my, my last lecture, you know, symbolic interaction, like it depends, everything is situational. So it depends, it depends on the families. It depends on the, how those families interact with the others. It depends on who's who, what friends they have. And I would say those friends have a heavy influence on the behaviors of your, on your own behavior. So be careful who your friends are and who you keep around you. Um, because you can learn how to justify certain behaviors. You can learn how to do criminal behavior by observing others, you know, commit crimes or, or participate in, in whatever risk-taking behavior um, is out there. So, um, so spending time with members of a drug subculture incre increases the attitude and behaviors 
favorable to your drug use. So legitimizing um, why you're taking it or justify, justifying why it's a good thing or so all of those things, you know, being with others that do that and will encourage the likelihood of you also partaking in those things. So once one is labeled an alcoholic or a drug addict, he or she will have difficulty discontinuing use because, you know, a person also always has the, at the beginning, the opportunity to accept a label or reject a label. And so if you've rejected the label, then, you know, that's, you can move on, you can show other types of behaviors and maybe not engage in certain, you know, risk-taking behaviors like drug taking alcoholism or drug, drug abuse and alcohol abuse. Um, however, if you're constantly labeled and maybe it's not the truth, but you're constantly being labeled this way, um, perhaps at some point, um, accepting the label, um, when, when there is a need for escape and having seen how other people use it as escape and, and giving in sort of, so to speak. Okay. So functionalists, this is functional theory. Some people call it structural functionalism. Um, so social institutions of control, like the family education and religion, um, have become disorganized. And so in, in external law enforcement controls are now necessary in order to prevent um, or to punish or to overt it happening. So illicit drug activities serve important societal functions. Um, and so like not having a good prevention and not, you know, obviously if you don't prevent it from happening, you're not actively trying to prevent it. And you know that people are going to do it because our we have a culture that encourages drug and alcohol use. Um, we have a, a criminal justice system that is, you know, can be seen as like, well, we have government jobs and they, if they don't know, if they weren't, didn't get a good socialization, like socialization is defined as the way that we learn our culture. Um, so your parents are responsible for socializing religion, um, education, your peers, media. So if you were incorrectly socialized, then, you know, sending you to jail is a way to re-socialize you in order to help, help you live correctly by our normative standards, by our laws and norms. So having people that deviate from our laws and norms is from a functionalist perspective, a good thing for society in a sense that it, you know, having people to, to deal with, um, deviant folks criminal that are engaged in criminal behavior provides jobs okay so the conflict perspective would say that people in positions of power um make some drugs illegal and so um meaning like i want to point out cocaine um so powder cocaine and crack cocaine so the, the penalty for crack cocaine because it's associated with um, black and Latinos folks and poor folks. Um, and those, so the users that, that use crack cocaine are more likely to be black, Latino, and poor. And those that use powdered cocaine are more likely to be middle-class or upper-class and white. And so, um, what's happened in, in a lot of places that we, there are, are, laws that are more permissible for powdered cocaine, meaning they're not going to carry the same penalty as crack cocaine. So people that have power maintain their power by putting other people asunder is the basic premise of conflict theory. And so here we have, um, and, and just moving on corporate interests perpetuate the use and abuse of illegal drugs. So you can think about the entertainment industry or music and film television industry where um, instead of um, highlighting the ways in which we can do better and the ways, ways in which we can be a better society and have like healthy behaviors, um, we, we have a culture that has film and um, social media and television and you name it, we have it regarding, you know, toxic masculinity and showing the ways in which people can be toxic by in using drugs and alcohol and, 
and expect that people in young adulthood expect it that they're going to do that. So we have a culture that's developed to expect young people to do these things instead of saying, we expect you to not do these things. And this is what health, health, good, healthy lifestyle looks like. And, um, but instead what we have is um, corporations that are supporting um, risk-taking behavior. And so from this perspective, you're looking at like um, showing behavior, behavior patterns that are, that negatively affect people um, in, an, in an effort to divide and conquer people. So that would be the conflict, conflict perspective. Okay, so in terms of like treatment programs and prevention programs, primary prevention programs are programs that seek to prevent drug problems before they even begin. So we see these like, like when I was growing up, we had um, D.A.R.E. Um, the D.A.R.E. program was to keep, I think their tagline was to keep kids off drugs. Um, and one of the, the biggest problem with the D.A.R.E. program is that it never really taught people children why why is auntie so and so why is mommy or daddy using drugs and it 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 overts it's it doesn't tell the truth to children it was just is probably the, the number one problem with some of these um prevention programs and that um the reason why people take drugs is because to them it feels good there's something in their life where they feel like they need escapism or or just to feel something different and um, to have less inhibitions or whatnot. And that, you know, the first time you take that particular drug, it might feel good. Um, but they, you know, might teach, teach kids that like um, that the constant use of alcohol or drugs um, while, while it may make you feel good that first time um, if it doesn't kill you is that um every time you use that drug or, or alcohol, um, it takes more to get you that same high. So that's one of the reasons why people come to develop a problem is that they're, they're partaking in more and more and more, um, in order to get that same high. And then their body can go through lots of physiological, um, not change, but, um, illnesses in order in in going through de detoxifying that stuff in their system in any case secondary prevention okay so secondary prevention programs lead to um, programs seek to limit the extent of drug use and um, prevent the spread of other substances beyond those already experienced um, and then also can teach strategies for responsible use of illicit drugs so um, not as common. Um, pre prevention is, I would say, the most often used. Um, tertiary prevention are programs that seek to limit relapses by individuals in recovery. Um, okay, skipping that, because this, this is kind of old. All right, um, so structural factors that contribute to drug problems. There's a dramatic change in the economic and technological basis of society. And we see that growing gap between the rich and the poor and inequalities based on race, ethnicity, and gender. So when it comes to public policy and private action, programs must attack the social basis as well as treat individual addicts and also focus on reducing demand while rather than just stopping the supply. So it's not just a one prong approach. It has to be multifaceted um, in order to, to alleviate this social issue. So there's also enforcement programs. And so the enforcement programs involved in efforts in preventing drug use from entering the country or from being produced within the country. Um, and they can include the capture, prosecution, imprisonment of users, dealers, and pushers. And so also the communities can, can participate in policing by citizens, by having um, you know, an, an active group of citizens that show up to meetings that are on councils to, um, you know, like I said, focus groups. So this would be a great action for a focus group for community policing, because then you talk about where the hotspots in 
your neighborhoods are and um, how, you know, private citizens can, by having these, these kind of conversations, help police to identify ways in which, you know, they're being affected or, you know, they don't want to use a park because they're constantly being overrun by um, dealers or whatnot. So having those things being addressed um, by, by community members um, as kind of like the eyes and ears of police officers um, can, can definitely help. All right. So public policy and private action number two in treating addicts. So, you know, putting them through detox program to help them eliminate the dependence through a supervised withdrawal, because it's important to note that if, if a, a person that is addicted to drugs or alcohol, um, and trying to get healthy, and trying to get all the alcohol out of the system, their body is dependent on it. The dependent, I mean, you'll see um, them shake. You can see them, sometimes they'll go through seizures. Sometimes they have fevers. Um, they're sick. Their stomach is sick. They have terrible diarrhea. Um, and so, yeah, I have worked in a detox facility um, and it's not a pretty picture and to see how sick they are um, in this process. And usually it's, you know, a week or more, 11 days can be anywhere from four days. Minimum was the place that I was, I was working at um, from four days to up to 11 days, even 15 days at the most, depending on insurance. So, yeah. And it's important to have it met them go through a medical withdrawal. Um, so that they're being observed by nurses um, and a doctor um, because they may need that, may need it. Um, okay, so a brief intervention in therapy and group therapy, um, having support from their friends and family members and educational and prevention programs. Um, which increase the t which increase the tax on cigarettes, requiring smoke free work sites, and placing anti smoking ads in the media, and anti drug advertising and decriminalization of drug use. So, um, and also encouraging parental behavior. So that is my lecture. If you have any questions or comments, concerns, please reach out to me. Uh, you can email me or. Um, get a hold of me through Canvas inbox. Have a wonderful day. Bye.